Welcome back to our ultrasound case of the month series. As always, email me with any questions or concerns at gzon at iu.edu. This month will be unique because we are not discussing a specific case, yet instead covering ultrasound guided IVs because it is one of the most common utilizations of ultrasound in most departments and a skill I am asked about frequently. The complexity of patients treated in an acute care setting makes this a problem we all encounter multiple times a shift. While the skill is fairly simple, the learning curve is quite steep. Through my experience teaching and performing this skill, hopefully I can pass on some tips and tricks that can fast track your success in mastering ultrasound guided placement. This picture shows the essentials needed for an ultrasound guided IV. Single use sterile gel and sterile skin prep are needed to reduce infection risk. I utilize a tourniquet for vessel distension, allowing for a larger target. Also, the two longer IV catheters are what my department stocks. As this diagram shows, a longer catheter is not only needed to access deeper veins, it is also important to limit extravasation risk by securing enough length of the catheter in the vessel that arm movement doesn't result in migration. Another item I think is essential is a single-use sterile probe cover. While there is considerable variation in real-world practice, the American Institute of Ultrasound Medicine advocates for the use of a single-use cover, yet of note does not recommend full sterile precautions like we utilize for central lines. The American College of Emergency Physicians has a similar policy statement with recommendations for a probe cover and sterile gel when placed in ultrasound IV. And finally, a recent intersocietal position statement released by five different professional organizations supports low-level disinfection of the probe with wipes that most of us have available in our departments. I have simplified all this into three main points. First, disinfecting wipes provide the recommended low-level disinfection. Utilize an appropriate wipe before and after the procedure. Second, use a sterile single-use gel packet and not gel from multi-use bottles found on most machines. Third, use some type of cover or barrier between the probe and the patient. While not without controversy given the theoretical ability to damage the probe surface and questions about pore size, I utilize a tegaderm as my barrier. Based on years of experience, I and others have not witnessed damage to probes. As an added safety precaution, it is advised to add a thin film of gel to the rubber surface of the probe so the tegaderm doesn't adhere as tightly and cause damage when pulled off. Additionally, the 27 nanometer pore size site on the manufacturer website is small enough to limit hepatitis B, C, and HIV. I think it's far superior to no barrier and one I would be comfortable with for myself or my family. Before discussing technique, we need a quick anatomy review of the veins of the upper extremity. The deep veins are documented here and can be simplified to be the axillary, brachial, radial, and ulnar vein. These are the superficial veins with the cephalic and basilic veins being the most commonly accessed. Yet rather than focusing on a specific vein, focus on what you visualize when scanning the arm to find an appropriate target. I personally start the midform and travel proximal until I find an appropriate vessel. So what is an appropriate vessel? There actually has been some work in this area. Researchers found the best chance for success was a sweet spot of depth between 0.3 centimeters and 1.6 centimeters. This allows enough depth to visualize the needle, yet not too much where reaching the vessel becomes an issue. And of no surprise, bigger vessels are easier to cannulate. Some have simplified these numbers to what is known as the rule of fives, meaning target vessels 0.5 centimeters to 1.5 centimeters that are at least 0.5 centimeters in diameter. So what does a vein look like on ultrasound? Veins should be easily compressible and non-pulsatile like the structure on the right. Arteries like the one on the left tend to be non-compressible. Yet if the patient is hypotensive or excessive pressure is applied, the artery can be collapsed like in this video. An additional structure can be seen as well. The classic honeycomb appearance of a nerve just inferior to the vein becomes clearly visible as pressure is applied. It is highlighted in yellow and should be avoided during cannulation attempts. Another thing that you might notice in the picture is the dashed white line in the center. This is a setting offered by many machines that correlates with the center arrow on the probe. It can be helpful to make sure you start out with everything lined up correctly. Here's a clip showing a better target than the previous image because the vein is all alone without an accompanying artery or nerve. This is the type of vessel I would recommend for those learning this skill since you have some room for error. As your skill increases and you can easily follow your needle, more difficult cannulations can be attempted. Speaking of a more difficult cannulation, this vein target is complicated by the close presence of the artery and nerve. Are you able to identify these structures? I have color-coded all relevant anatomy with the venous structures in blue, the artery in red, and the nerve with its characteristic honeycomb appearance in yellow. While this is an easy IV, it should only be attempted if you are confident with your ability to follow your needle tip. After you identify a target, always get in a position of comfort. Sit down with the screen easily in your view. This is a fine motor procedure and simple steps like this make a difference. 
Once a vein is located, there is often confusion about where to poke in relation to the probe. There is considerable practice variation, but I personally don't like poking as close to the probe as possible. I have seen too many people puncture probe covers this way when placing central lines. Instead, I use math to my advantage. By appreciating the Pythagorean theorem, you can roughly estimate how much length you will need to hit the vessel and where to puncture in relation to your probe. While I don't calculate this for patients, I utilize the concept for a rough estimate. If nothing else, it gives an appreciation that you need more length than the depth of the vessel you are targeting. With this example of the vessel center being one centimeter deep, I go back one centimeter from the probe. I puncture at that point superficially into the skin, then slide the probe towards my needle to find the tip echogenicity. Then I proceed to navigate down towards the vessel. The technique works great for deeper vessels, yet for more superficial vessels, you need to insert your needle at a much more superficial angle so you can locate the tip and still have room to navigate. Yet keep in mind that the more superficial your angle, the longer the distance required to reach the vessel. This concept is very important to remember when not using longer link catheters. The next few diagrams allow clear conceptualization of the needle in the vein. The image on the left represents a long axis view with the image on the right showing the corresponding short axis view. After watching this, you might think that long axis placement is better since the entire needle can be visualized. However, in clinical practice, many clinicians learning this skill struggle with long axis placement given the fact that the thin ultrasound beam has to be kept directly in line with a small vessel and a submillimeter needle. Based on this experience, I always initially teach a short axis approach. As you gain skill with your ability to manipulate the probe and the needle, long axis approaches can be attempted and are helpful in some situations. The next diagram shows how I personally perform ultrasound guide IVs and how I teach the skill. I find my target and puncture superficially back from the probe based on our previous Pythagorean theorem concept. I then slide the probe towards my needle until the echogenicity of the tip reveals itself. After this, I walk the needle down to the vein. This allows me to always know my needle tip location. Losing track of the needle tip turns a precise process into a game of luck. Walking the needle down means find the needle tip and then sliding the probe away from the needle until it disappears. Then you push the needle in farther towards the probe and your needle tip reappears. This process is repeated down to the center of the vessel. After I walk the needle into the vessel, I confirm my needle tip is within the center of the vessel by obtaining what we call the target sign. As I fan away from my needle, the echogenicity should disappear within the center of the vessel, confirming the needle tip. This is often referred to as the vanishing target sign. This clip shows the target sign in a real patient, with the bright echogenicity coming into view as you slide towards your needle with the probe and it vanishing as you slide away. What is confusing to some is that since you only get a thin slice of the ultrasound beam, the shaft of the needle can give a target sign. Yet if that is the case, as you slide away from the needle, the echogenicity doesn't disappear yet travels deeper. After I am confident that my needle tip is within the center of the vessel, I decrease my angle and walk the needle farther down the length of the vessel. By having a less acute angle and more of the catheter within the vessel when you pass it, success increases dramatically. This concept is farther supported by a picture of an IV catheter. The needle is clearly longer than the catheter and flash can be obtained without the catheter portion in the vessel. By making sure you walk more of the needle into the vessel, you can ensure the catheter portion is within the vessel making cannulation easier. So what does this look like on a real patient? You will see my initial superficial puncture of the skin, and then me sliding the probe towards the needle to locate it on the screen. What you will notice is the very small movements of my hand with both the needle and the probe. The fine motor skill required is often underappreciated by those who have not performed this procedure. The next thing I want to point out is the stepwise walk down of the needle as I slowly slide the probe away from the needle and then insert the needle deeper. One thing that surprises many people is the fact that flash is obtained, yet I don't pass the catheter right away. This is not a landmark-based IV. I slightly decrease my angle and secure more of the catheter within the vessel before I pass the catheter off. Passing the catheter into the vessel is actually harder than most think, and I recommend doing this with one hand because even the simple step of putting the probe down to gain access to your other hand causes considerable movement of the needle tip, risking dislodging the needle out of the vessel. Once I pass the catheter, I don't fully extract the needle. This step allows time to place a 4x4 gauze, take down the tourniquet, and connect the IV connector without causing a mess. The patient did give written consent due to visualization of his tattoo. I performed this IV after the patient failed multiple vascular access attempts and I did not want to delay antibiotics given his septic process. 
Here's a video showing a side-by-side -side comparison of IV access on a model with what is visualized on the ultrasound screen. The same concepts hold true as our previous examples. The superficial puncture, the slide towards the needle to find the echogenic tip, the walk down with sliding the probe away to lose the echogenicity of the needle, and then pushing the needle into the ultrasound field to regain visualization of the needle tip. Accessing the vessel, becoming more superficial and walking more of the catheter within the vessel with clear identification of the target sign and vanishing target sign to confirm needle tip. And finally, stabilizing everything and utilizing one hand to pass the catheter into the vessel. And finally, while we have not discussed long axis IV placement since I considered it to be a more advanced skill that should only be attempted after mastery of short axis placement, I do advocate for long axis views to obtain confirmation of the catheter within the vessel. Here we can see the catheter transversing the soft tissue into the vessel. In summary, there are five simple steps to follow. First, prepare and have everything readily available. Get in a position of comfort with the screen in your line of sight. Make sure you clean the probe and utilize a barrier and ensure access to a longer length catheter if targeting a deeper vessel. Second, vessel identification. Search for an adequate target first in the form and gradually progress up the arm. Remember, bigger diameter vessels are easier and there is a sweet spot between 0.3 and 1.6 centimeters. Ensure your target is easily compressible and the walls touch during compression. And finally, identify any adjacent structures to avoid during your cannulation attempt. Third, plan out your puncture. With deeper vessels, appreciate the length of the catheter required for cannulation. I like the Pythagorean theorem concept with deeper vessels, so if one centimeter deep, go one centimeter back from your probe. If 1.5 centimeters deep, go 1.5 centimeters back from your probe. Regardless of what strategy you choose, puncture in a superficial manner and locate your needle tip. Once your needle tip is located, walk it down into the vessel. Obtain the vanishing target sign to ensure you are visualizing the needle tip in the vessel. Fourth, passing the catheter. Decrease the angle of your catheter and walk the needle and catheter apparatus farther into the vessel. Confirm a vanishing target sign one more time and pass the catheter. I prefer a one-handed approach given the decreased movement of the tip within the vessel. The catheter should pass smoothly without resistance. Fifth, securing the line. Only partially retract the needle. Take down the tourniquet and place a 4x4 under the catheter to absorb any blood as you secure the IV connector to the catheter. Confirmation is twofold. The line should easily draw back and flush, and a long axis view can easily be employed to locate the catheter in the vessel. Once confirmed, place your IV dressing to safely secure the line, and finally clean the probe for future users. Thanks for watching. I hope this has been informative and will help you take better care of patients. Please email me with any questions or concerns.